we tend to endow the structures of our world, both physical and political, with a sense of permanence. We think of the world as it has developed as having been inevitable. And we envision this trajectory projecting in a straight line indefinitely into the future. Two thousand years ago, the Roman Forum was the power center of Western civilization. Legend has it that Rome was founded here when warring tribes on two neighboring hills met in a swampy lowland between them to make peace. The swamp was drained and the area developed into a grand public space, a rectangular plaza surrounded by masterpieces of classical architecture. This Forum Romanum became the focal point of political, commercial, and religious life for the vast Roman Empire. Here in the Forum, senators of the Roman Republic debated each other and spoke out to their constituents. Theatrical performances and gladiatorial contests entertained the masses. Religious temples exalted the pagan gods. Exotic goods from all across the empire were bought and sold. And the military leaders responsible for expanding that empire were honored with triumphal processions through the streets of Rome, culminating in the Forum. The architectural remnants of this greatest of societies, preserved through centuries to immortalize its bygone prestige, were what I expected to see when I traveled to Rome. But I didn't expect to see another very different type of ruin. In the midst of the Forum ruins were a series of small, irregular spaces, like some kind of primitive apartment building. At first I was surprised that archaeologists had been allowed to dig up the venerable Forum to uncover what seemed to be a much less significant construction from an earlier era. But then I realized that the forum hadn't been excavated. The floor level of the forum was below these buildings. These primitive tenements had been built on top of the forum itself, centuries later. This didn't make any sense. I mean, who was the first slumlord developer who had the balls to break ground in the middle of the forum to build his shanty town. It's a complete disregard for, and desecration of, the enduring memory of Rome's former greatness. He might as well have carved a new inscription on what remained of the crumbling ruins to say, Id yam non refert. This matters no more. We tend to endow the structures of our world with a sense of permanence. But in medieval times, after centuries of neglect, dismantling, flooding, and erosion, the Forum Romanum became known by another name, Campo Vaccino. Translation? The Cowfield. If you were a Roman at the time of Julius Caesar, standing on the marble floor of the Forum and trying to envision its future, could you ever have conceived that this place being not only abandoned, but even forgotten? Could you have fathomed the possibility that one day this marketplace of bread and circuses would serve only grass for cattle? And would you ever have believed that one day, on this ground where senators spoke, there would be nothing but bullshit? Could our society ever evolve to the point where the power structures of government were so needless that the best use of the mall in Washington, D.C. would be grazing land for cattle? Rather than permanence, let's consider the probability of impermanence. Rather than inevitability, let's consider the necessity of evolution. Let's consider a possible future of an architecture. Welcome to An Architecture, exploring the built environment of a stateless society. My name's Tim, I'm an architect living in Boston. My name's Joe, I'm Tim's brother, I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. Let's start by explaining what this podcast is about and why we're doing it. The built environment of a stateless society. Let's break that down. So first of all, what is the built environment? So the built environment is uh, simply stuff that's built. It's our homes, our cities, our roads, um, our offices. It's all the things that we as humans have constructed in the physical world around us to make it the way that we want it. 
Okay, so that's in contrast, I guess, to the natural environment, which is what people usually think of when they use the word environment, uh, which is everything else that's not man-made. That's right. Uh, the built environment was made by humans. The natural environment was made by ancient aliens. Okay, so I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in this episode. But uh, before we get to that, you've said it's the built environment of a stateless society. So what exactly is a stateless society? Are you Are talking about some anarchists with uh, pointy mustaches throwing bombs at buildings? Well, it is anarchists, or at least we're going to use that word anarchists. But it has nothing to do with violence. In fact, it's the opposite of violence. The kind of anarchism we're going to be talking about is the idea that it is possible for people to meet their needs and resolve conflicts without initiating force. So that concept of initiating force is what's really important there, and we're going to be talking about that a lot more as we go along. And when we think about government or political solutions, these generally always depend on some sort of initiation of force, whether through taxation or regulation. With these things, there's always some underlying threat of either imprisonment or worse. So if you're somebody who, like us, think that the initiation of force is a bad thing, then congratulations, you're an anarchist, and you might be interested in the kind of ideas we're going to be talking about on this podcast. So let's talk about why we're making an anarchitecture podcast. I think a lot of people are interested in the built environment, and it's something that really everybody can relate to. There are aspects of history, theory, or philosophy, again, the natural environment, Certainly regulations and examples of conflict and cooperation that come through in a lot of discussions about the built environment. So I think with this podcast, we can introduce these people who are interested in the built environment to these other ideas of nonviolent, non-governmental approaches to meeting the needs of individuals and society. So we're going to be talking a bit about how the built environment influences our actions and also how our actions influence it. So the second motivation is for people who are already interested in anarchism uh, to introduce them to concepts about the built environment and explain why they should care about the built environment. For anarchists, the built environment presents opportunities to explore these concepts of anarchism as they apply to the real world. There's a lot of talk out there or theory about how an anarchic world could work, and we want to take that to the next level and really show what that world could look like, not just how it's going to work. All right. So instead of just talking about insurance companies and legal principles, we can actually talk about more tangible things that, uh, that we think would develop in the real world. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure how many minds have ever been changed by talking about insurance companies. <laughs> I think that this vision of the built environment is important to convince anarchists and non-anarchists alike that an anarchist society is conceivable, possibly achievable, and ultimately desirable. Okay, so now we're going to introduce a framework for understanding the built environment. We call this the scales framework. And if you're familiar with the uh, Powers of Ten video, which came out in the 70s sometime, they start with the camera zoomed in on a guy's hand they keep zooming it out into space until you can see all these galaxies. And then they zoom it back into his hand and then all the way until you can see the atoms in his hand. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we're looking to do here. <laughs> yeah, Joe used to work in planetarium, so this is the kind of thing that he gets excited about. <laughs> the large-scale structure of the universe. <laughs> right. Plus, it was made by Charles and Ray Eames, who were architects, so I guess I should be excited about it, too. Everybody's excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> The first concept we're going to introduce is an idea of spatial or physical scales, which describe how we interact with the built environment and how it influences us. We'll also talk about time scales, which is a similar concept, but rather than zooming out in space, we'll be slowing down and fast forwarding time, sort of like a time lapse camera, so that you can uh, understand the change that is relevant at each scale. All right, so first of all, talking about these uh, physical or spatial scales, let's start small and we'll get bigger. So the first scale we're going to start thinking about is your immediate environment, which you might call your living room. The idea here is that this is where individuals are acting directly uh, with their environment, with whatever activity they're engaged in at the moment. And so one aspect of a single room is that it's generally has a reasonably specific function, like a kitchen is for preparing food, living rooms for watching TV, whatever it is that you do in your living room, bedrooms for sleeping. <laughs> 
And so zooming out from a room, we've basically got a collection of rooms, which you might call a house, believe it or not. Right. And some of this is going to be a little obvious, but again, just, just kind of defining this framework uh, will help us later to talk about a little more, um, more complex ideas. Within a house, you've basically got a, a wider range of activities that, uh, that you can do. In a room, you might just have one person. In a house, you might have a whole family. So this is where you start to see a bit more of uh, interpersonal interactions. Right. So then you start to have uh, the potential for conflict uh, where people need to share or at least delegate uh, resources for whatever activities they're doing. But then there's also potential for cooperation where uh, people working together can do things that one person on their own couldn't do. So then the next scale, moving outside of the house, um, you have your whole property. The distinction here is really that, well, two things. For one, now you're outside. So now you're dealing with the outside environment. So you have weather, noise, and basically a lot of the things that we're trying to protect ourselves from when we go inside the house. Um, another important aspect um, of the broader property is that now you've established a boundary where your activities and your family's activities are separated from those of your neighbors. So now you can start to have some potential boundary conflicts with other people, um, whether it's disturbances or things like pollution. Noise. That smell. <laughs> <laughs> right. But again, as you start to interact with more people, um, there are also more opportunities for cooperation. So you've probably heard this phrase, good fences make good neighbors, which is from a Robert Frost poem. Although actually in that poem, uh, somebody else was saying that line to him, and then he spent the rest of the poem challenging that concept. So the jury's out on whether or not that's actually the case. Robert Frost is the official authority on boundary conflicts. Yeah, Robert, Robert Frost is a staunch anarchist. <laughs> Of course he is. He's from New Hampshire. <laughs> right. The original free stater. <laughs> Live free or die. Now that we've brought neighbors into the picture, of course, you want to move out a bit further and, until you get to the actual neighborhood. And this is where you start to see more of a sort of social community developing. You've got multiple people interacting together to try to achieve some common goals. Right. And so when we start talking about a bigger area, uh, you start to get bigger problems that uh, most likely need to be solved by bigger groups of people. So the other side of this is that within the neighborhood, you also have potential for greater cooperation within the community. In fact, you need to have cooperation within the community in order to, in order to resolve any conflicts and develop the services that everybody needs over a broader area. They can basically pool their resources a bit more and uh, achieve bigger things. Right, and start to get some efficiencies of scale. So the next scale we'll talk about is... You could call it a city. I'm going to call it a metropolis just to make the distinction that it's not a uh, necessarily a political boundary. So metropolis is a collection of neighborhoods. At this point, you start to get into a larger social group. Of course, there's still a sense of community, um, but here you start to get larger organizations forming. Well, and you've got groups of groups of organizations as well. So you've got you know rather than just having kind of one neighborhood council or whatever, you've got many neighborhood councils as well as other types of organizations. So when you have all these different community groups coming together, it creates a possibility for greater conflict where you could have some groups competing with other groups. So here you start to develop structures of power defining which groups have more influence than other groups over certain activities. And within a metropolis area, you get enough population that you can really start to develop more complex means of interaction such as markets, where you, you can start to see a bit more division of labor and specialization so that people can introduce more efficiency into the way they produce things and solve problems for each other. Another thing we start to see at the scale of the metropolis is the forming of cultural identity. So people really start to identify themselves with the place that they live, and they start to share things like their local history and local customs, which makes it easier for them to all work together. The next step up from the metropolis scale is what we'll call the region scale. This can vary quite a bit in terms of the actual geographic size as well as the, the resources within it. But the general idea is that there's at least a few different metropolis regions within it or metropolis areas within it. Um, there's a large number of people. Rather than having sort of a well-defined social groups, you've got a widespread network of interacting groups. And at this scale, we can see a lot more division of labor, a lot more specialization, you can have different areas such as farmland or factories or cities. Yeah, so regions can be 
defined by specific characteristics. And we're all familiar with political boundaries where you have states and nations that are defined on a map based on what government is running them. But you could also have geographic boundaries, such as a river valley or a coastal region or a mountainous region, I suppose. You could also have cultural boundaries, for example, where a group of people in a given area all speak the same language. Now, when you start to have these cultural boundaries, you can start to have an us versus them mentality, right? So it's like the Red Sox versus the Yankees, right? Right, good versus evil. Where again, people are identifying themselves with a certain place, but also identifying people outside of that place as not part of their group. So there is a potential for conflict there, especially if larger groups within regions start to have conflicts over resources. And at the same time, if the people can work through these differences or these perceived differences, then they can develop more robust market structures. So an example of that is you could have people in Florida growing oranges and people in Vermont making maple syrup and then trading maple syrup for oranges. Or maybe they put the maple syrup on the oranges. So then really the last scale is the globe where you're looking at humanity as a whole. So here we're taking an all-inclusive look at really all the problems and concerns throughout the world between a number of different regions. So to sum up these scales again, uh, we started with the living room, your immediate environment. We move from there out to the house where you start to have a collection of rooms and a collection of different activities. From there we talked about property where you start to engage with the exterior environment as well as boundaries. From there we move out to the neighborhood uh, where you start to have a number of different properties as well as roads and infrastructure to support them. And there we start thinking more about community. The next scale up it was metropolis, which is a collection of neighborhoods where you start to have larger and more complex organizations of people interacting. From there we zoomed out again to talk about regions, which we define more broadly based on certain characteristics about the place. And here you start to have groups interacting with each other in more complex networks. And then of course the last scale is uh, the whole globe where we we're looking at humanity as a whole. So now we want to look at scales from a different point of view. Rather than talking about spatial scales, uh, we want to talk about time scales. That's right, and the idea here is to visualize how the built environment changes as a result of human and natural influences. So one way you can think about this is you've probably seen some time-lapse video where the camera's speeding up or slowing down at different speeds and everyone knows what slow motion is in movies. So there's, there's really a couple of different directions you can go with this. So, of course, you start at normal time, which is just you know, the way people perceive things happening every day. But then you can slow down the action. And of course, an extreme example of this would be something like uh, in The Matrix, where Neo's dodging bullets, and the only motion you see is the bullets and, of course, the superhero, Neo, who can move as fast as the bullets. But everything else basically looks like it's stuck still. Going in the opposite direction, uh, you get something like time-lapse photography, where you're basically taking, say, one photo every half hour or something like that, and what that does is when you compile it together to a video, it basically looks like things are happening really fast. A typical example of this might be something that shows a, a flower growing and blooming all within a period of a few seconds. And another example of this might be every single mobile phone ad where it shows some busy street corner and uh, there's the one hipster who's there on his cool phone with the stupid thing in his ear. And uh, you know he's, he's at normal time, but everyone else around him is zooming past like Charlie Chaplin which makes him look cool because, you know, they all look like Charlie Chaplin. And one more example that's uh, pretty interesting is the world's longest-running experiment, which is in uh, Queensland, Australia. It's called the Pitch Drop Experiment, and it's basically just this blob of pitch that's just hanging from a vessel, and uh, the idea What's is... What's pitch? Pitch is... I don't actually know what it is. It's, <laughs> it's basically some sort like of... Pine, like pine tar? Yeah, it's like, like pine that. tar. It, it's what they used to use to basically seal up ships you know, way back when. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that you heat it up and it's soft and malleable and, and basically a liquid. But then once it gets to room temperature, it solidifies and it's basically like glass. You can actually break it with a hammer and it shatters. But what this experiment is, is they've got this stuff sitting at room temperature. And so I think since 1927, there have only been nine drops from this thing. And what it demonstrates is that this is actually a liquid still. However, it does have the properties of a solid if you look at it in real time. So you can imagine if you had a time-lapse camera taking one photo a day of that thing for every day since 1927, then 
you know, it might start looking like some really thick syrup, like maple syrup, which you could put on your oranges. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there is actually a, a time-lapse camera on the webpage that you can go and see this thing, which it's not quite fast enough to make it exciting. <laughs> oh, another interesting thing about that is that with these uh, nine drops that have fallen, I don't think any living person has ever actually seen it fall. <laughs> There's like this one old guy that looks after this thing, and he's like, he's always like in the bathroom or something whenever it actually happens. <laughs> So when we start thinking about timescales applied to the built environment, generally the built environment tends to be static and unchanging over short timescales, but dynamic and more adaptive to our, our needs over longer timescales. Um, and the larger the spatial scale, so where you have bigger buildings, bigger cities, the longer time frame um, is needed for change to occur at that scale or change to occur that's going to affect that scale. And that's as a general rule, of course, you know, there's of course, there's events that can happen that can change things pretty quickly, such as natural disasters or earthquakes or... Um, wars. Wars. Alien invasion. When we start talking about change, uh, there's a few different forms that that could take. It could be cyclical change, which is something that basically repeats within a certain time frame. Or it could be acyclical or evolutionary, which means that there's some sort of lasting change that has occurred. And of course, something that, when you look at it at a small scale may look like it's acyclical or evolutionary. Uh, when you zoom out to a, a longer time scale, it might be revealed that that's actually a, a cyclical activity. So one example of something that is acyclical at a short time scale, but uh, proves to be cyclical at a longer scale, would be the weeds growing in my yard, which are literally up to my eyeballs right now. <laughs> uh, we get these things that grow in Australia that, that I, I ripped them all out last year, and uh, yeah, right now they're all right back as tall as I am. Uh, weed whackers in Australia? They come right back. <laughs> <laughs> Those things just laugh at weed whackers. If you look at it over a period of, of a couple of months, you see that they're just growing and growing. But over an annual cycle, you see that they grow, they die, they come back. Circle of life. Okay, so let's start talking about what some different timescales are that are helpful in thinking about changes in the built environment. And as we go along, I think you'll see that each of these time scales um, correspond more or less to the spatial scales that we talked about. So um, some of the shorter time scales will correspond better to the smaller spatial scales, and the longer time scales will correspond to the larger spatial scales. The first spatial scale we talked about was your immediate environment. So when we start thinking about a time scale that relates to this, we would be looking pretty short term. It could be momentary or maybe hourly. So this is the time that you're doing a certain activity within a certain space. Um, within the built environment, the actual built structures don't change a lot during a minute-to-minute -minute or hourly time frame, but some of the things that you're using within that space um, would change. So one example of, of that might be, uh, you know, the, the kids make a mess, and then I pick it up, and the kids make another mess. So here we have a cyclical change. <laughs> right. Every single hour. <laughs> an, an ending cyclical change. So when we think about our experience of a space at the hourly time scale, um, it's possible that you might be staying within the same room for an hour or, or more than an hour doing one activity. Um, if you work in an office, you could be in the same place for eight hours in the day. So this brings us to the next scale, which is the daily scale. So here we're looking at change that occurs through the course of a day. So one example of this uh, might be that the kitchen gets messy and at the end of the day you've got to do the dishes. Sounds like your house is a mess. <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> and so again, at the daily time scale, you don't have a lot of change happening at larger spatial scales. So for instance, uh, the city doesn't change much. So one thing that does happen at the daily scale is even though the actual buildings and structures aren't changing in the built environment, you know, as you go from day to night, um, you do have changes within let's say a city infrastructure where the lights are coming on, obviously traffic patterns changing, different areas within the city becoming populated or, or emptying out as people go to work and, and go home. Right, so it's pretty likely that throughout the course of a day, people will be moving between different local environments. So you go from your house to the stores or to the office or to the beach. That's a, not really a built environment thing, is it? <laughs> to the gym. <laughs> At a broad scale of sort of the, the city level or the metropolis level, this looks reasonably cyclical that each day you kind of see the same patterns emerging. 
So the next scale would be looking at a few days or weeks or maybe a monthly cycle. So at this scale, you have some larger cycles that are established, but you also start to see acyclical changes um, that affect more lasting change on the built environment. An example of cyclical change might be some minor maintenance tasks that occur at larger scales, such as trash removal, street sweepers, and an example of, of an acyclical change would be some of the progress that you might see on a, on a construction project, or you might even see the completion of some you know, minor road works or small jobs like that. So at this scale, we also start to see more influence from the natural environment, where over a series of weeks or months, you have weeds growing, which Joe is whacking down in his yard on a daily basis. Or monthly basis or weekly basis, I guess. They whack me down. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the winter, at least in New England, you have snow accumulating, which melts in June. Within a weekly or monthly sort of time frame, you might see people moving between different cities for either vacation, conferences, meetings, or uh, you know, fly-in, fly-out sort of work. Right, so over this time frame people tend to experience a broader spatial scale than they do on an hourly or daily scale. Okay, so the next time scale that we'll look at is, is what we'd call either the seasonal or annual time scale. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind when you think of seasons is, of course, that nature will have more significant effects here. And of course, we've, we've talked about some of the cyclical changes that occur throughout the year. Some of the effects that these can have at this time scale would be, for example, you've got to prepare your house for winter, Make sure you don't have any burst pipes at the neighborhood level or, or, the, or the city level. Uh, you might see potholes developing in roads. If you live within a private development, those potholes would get fixed. If they're public roads, they won't. <laughs> if you live in Massachusetts, you end up driving on the surface of the moon. <laughs> That's an acyclical change. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so at this scale, at the seasonal or annual scale, you start to see some real changes uh, in the built environment. And with construction projects, you can certainly see those completed, uh, buildings torn down and new buildings going up. Also, if you think about agriculture, you're planting and harvesting crops um, over the course of a year. So maybe just to clarify that, agriculture would be considered part of the built environment, right? Even though it's plants, it's plants that are put there by man. Yeah, I mean, I mean we don't need to put too fine a point on it, but... If we're talking about the way that people are manipulating the environment around them, then that's certainly a big one. And so over the course of a year, you might see small projects that uh, individuals undertake that they can complete, such as some home maintenance or renovations. But some larger projects, such as a building or a road, uh, would require more cooperation between larger groups of people. So the next scale would be looking at multiple years, uh, maybe up to a decade. At this scale, you start to see larger infrastructure projects completed, such as a road system or skyscrapers or maybe a development of a mine. The individual experience tends to have less of an impact at this time scale. These are generally projects that are undertaken by much larger organizations. One change that, that can occur among individuals would be moving to a new city or a new house. So even though you're not effectively changing the built environment itself, you're essentially repositioning yourself within it. As we go out to the next time scale, which is the generational time scale, uh, this encompasses several decades, maybe between 20 to 50 years. And during this time frame, you might see technology change, you might see general needs of people changing, a good portion of the built environment going through its life cycle, uh, where you see old buildings being torn down and replaced. Right. So if you look at photographs of a city from, say, 50 years ago, and then look at the way it is today, there's usually quite a bit of change, even though you might not see that or notice that change happening as much on a day-to-day -day basis. An example of the sort of change you might see over this time frame is suburban expansion, as well as something like a mining town devolving into a ghost town once the mine's finished and closed. Or a car manufacturing town yeah. evolving into a ghost town. Yeah. So as you start to have these bigger changes taking place in the built environment, they can also have consequences to the existing built environment or to the natural environment that could be good or bad. Obviously, some bad examples are deforestation from expansion of development, um, loss of animal habitats. And a positive example of this change might be um, if a new transportation system gets built that allows people to move around from place to place a lot more efficiently than they could have before. 
And maybe a, a positive example would be if you plant a tree, then 20 or 30 years later, you've got a, a full-grown tree that you can chop down. Or if you don't cut your weeds, you get <laughs> yeah. full-grown trees. <laughs> if I don't cut my weeds in three months, I get full-grown trees. <laughs> <laughs> and so over a generational scale, individuals have much less of an impact on the built environment. And you see a lot more impact from both purposeful cooperation as well as uh, network effects. The next scale is the scale of centuries. Here you start to see much broader civilizational change where you could have cities and countries rising and falling, both economically and politically. There are plenty of examples of this throughout history, such as Babylon, Egypt, Greece, or as we talked about in the introduction, uh, the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire uh, lasted for a number of centuries and continued to develop and flourish throughout that time. But obviously at some point it hit a turning point where things then started to decay and become something very different. Over the course of a few centuries, it's pretty obvious that a, an individual action has very little effect. What we do see affecting change at this scale is more changes in ideology, technology, demographics, which all have a visible influence at this scale on how the built environment evolves. Right, so at this time scale, we start to think a lot about culture. I mean, there are a couple of ways that culture plays a role in the built environment here. Joe mentioned ideology. As we look at the example of Rome, one big change that happened to really change the fabric of Rome in particular and the Roman Empire in general uh, was the introduction and spread of Christianity, where all of a sudden it didn't make sense anymore for people to be preserving these pagan temples. People started literally dissembling those temples to reuse the stones in new Catholic churches in and around Rome. So I guess one person can have an impact. <laughs> if he's the son of God. <laughs> but at the same time, the built environment, in a historical sense, can really impact the culture of the present day. Historical buildings tend to preserve aspects of a past culture, or at least a past identity of a place, which can inform the present day culture. Okay, so that's really the broadest time scale that, that really has a visible effect on the built environment. So just to recap, so we started out with an, an hourly or a few hours time scale where you have a pretty significant impact over your immediate environment, but there's not much that changes at larger spatial scales. From there we went to the daily time scale, which is not much different, but you do start to see some patterns of change happening at larger spatial scales, such as traffic patterns in a city. From there we go out to a few days or, or weeks or months where you start to see more of an, a lasting effect from nature, larger scale maintenance tasks, as well as completion of some very small scale projects. And at the seasonal scale or, or annual scale, we start to see more of a definite impact from nature uh, where the people and, and the built environment itself have to respond to the demands that nature puts on it. And this has impacts really across the range of, of spatial scales, uh, anywhere from an individual's house out to a whole city or, or a whole region. And also at this scale, we start to see permanent construction projects being completed. So you can see basically a building going from start to finish. The next scale out from that is multiple years or up to a decade, uh, where you start to see some, some larger infrastructure projects completed. You might see individuals moving from one city to another, but otherwise they don't have much of an impact or much of a direct impact on the change. Uh, you see more change happening as a result of group actions or cooperation. And going up from there, we've got the generational scale, which is uh, where you start to see some more technological change, some demographic changes, as well as elements of the built environment going through a natural life cycle, such as a building being torn down and replaced. Also at the scale, we can start to notice more of the impact of the built environment on the natural environment, such as suburban expansion or the growth of new trees. And again, individual actions are less relevant here, and group actions or emergent phenomena of groups are more dominant. And then we get to the, the final scale of centuries, which is where we start to see entire kind of cities or regions being developed and then possibly crumbling or being superseded by new developments in other places. And this is generally a result of larger trends in the society. 
in the introduction, we talked about this concept of accepting impermanence. I think one of the challenges to starting to think about ideas that are really outside the box of what's normally accepted is realizing that whatever exists today doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I think that sometimes, even if there is a better solution or a better approach out there to something, people don't necessarily pursue it because they see what exists currently as something that is impossible to change. And when we talked about timescales, we talked about changes in ideology as something that have the potential to bring about significant and lasting change. We also talked about the purpose of this podcast, and as we start to think about this idea of changing ideology, I think that this podcast, or at least our hope for this podcast, is that it can help to contribute a unique point of view of thinking about the built environment to an ideological shift, uh, eventually to an ideal of anarchism. We haven't really introduced the ideas of anarchism in any detail yet. In this episode, we wanted to focus more on what people are mostly familiar with, which is the built environment itself. While some of the topics we covered today may have been a bit obvious to most listeners, given that everybody experiences the built environment every day, hopefully once we start introducing some of these other ideas and applying them to the framework that we've discussed today, things will get a bit more interesting. Oh yeah, this podcast is going to get a lot more interesting. <laughs> can only go up from here. Yeah.